sure your face You're good. Go for it. Go for it. Cool. There we go. Okay, I want to make sure that I'm on there as well. Okay, so we are going to be talking today about farming your neighborhood. How to become the go-to real estate agent in your neighborhood. And I'm going to put giant air quotes over your. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be the area that you live in. It could be the area that you do the most work in. It could be an area that is just your niche, your go-to, whatever that is. So we're going to talk about how to uh, find your neighborhood, how to farm your neighborhood, how to find the data that you need, and what to do with it once you get it. Um, before we start, as always, our breakfast is sponsored. So shout out to Snapshot and the Pros for providing, ooh, that's uh, colorful, um, for providing, there we go, our breakfast this morning, our bagels, our breakfast tacos, all that from Snapshot Image Pros. Grab yourself a flyer from the back. Um, there should be a coupon code on that to get 10% off of your next uh, listing photos. They do virtual staging, um, blue, uh, blue sky and green grass is included in all of their edits. Um, they can do item removal. I just had them go out and shoot a listing. Um, mom with young kids, there are kids toys all over the backyard able to go in and digitally remove all that sort of stuff to save for an hour of yard cleanup so that way uh, they can get the house on the market by this weekend. So whatever you, you, you all need, they're about to roll out uh, 360 tours as well, so I expect to see that starting in June. Come on then. So let's talk about farming our neighborhood. Here's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to start by figuring out how to pick, again, Air quotes, pick your neighborhood. Again, your neighborhood doesn't necessarily mean the neighborhood you live in. It could be, again, the neighborhood that you want to focus on. We're going to talk about how to find your farm list and how to build your farm list and the tools that you need to build a great distribution list. Good news, it's 100% free. Uh, who in the room is a member of the San Antonio Board of Realtors? That should be everybody in this room. Great. You're going to learn about a free tool, well, not technically free because that's what part of your quarterly payment goes to, but we're going to make sure that you are taking full advantage of that 150 bucks you're paying each and every quarter to save for. We're going to talk about, okay, cool, now you've built your list, what are you going to do with it? We're going to talk about how much is enough, and this is going to be the key to everything. Um, when it comes to geofarming, it's a long game, and we're going to talk about how to play that game right, and then I'll go over some resources that you're going to want to add into your toolkit again. Most of them are going to be free resources to make your life a little bit better and a little bit easier. So the first thing we're going to talk about is finding your ideal neighborhood. Your ideal neighborhood could be where you live. For me, mine is where I live. It is my neighborhood. I live there. I pay taxes there. It's where I live, but it's also my niche. I live close to Woodlawn Lake. My jam is historic homes. So I live where my niche is, so that's where I like to farm. Yes? What if where you live, there's a very low turnover? We'll talk about that. Your neighborhood could be where you list. Maybe you are the king or queen of listings in Alamo Ranch. Maybe you're the king or queen of listings in Converse. Maybe you have just a strong client base near Lackland, and now they're all, you know, relocating with military orders, and now you're coming back in and listing all those properties. Then I have folks who go, but somebody I've never had a listing in my whole entire life, the purpose of farming is so that I can get listings. We're doing this chicken and egg thing, and I don't like it. Cool. Where do you sell? You're doing business there. So I don't care if you helped a buyer or you have the seller. You have the ability to market yourself in that neighborhood. You don't have to pick just one of these. Maybe you like where you live and it's part of your niche, and maybe you do a lot of uh, sales in, I don't know, church area, and you want to double dip. That's totally fine. We're also going to talk about your budget, whether it's sweat equity or check equity, and what you can do with that data. What I recommend to everybody, take all your deals. Depending on how long you've been in real estate, I've been in almost three years. So I take my three years of data. Um, cut out some of the outliers down here and took a look and plotted them on a map. So I can very easily see this isn't my neighborhood. This isn't my neighborhood. If I want to farm where I'm doing business, 
I'm going to go northeast side, and I can zoom in. I can tell you most of it is Windcrest, Converse, uh, the north side of Kirby. That first year when I was selling the $161,000 house all day long, that's where a lot of that comes from. So for me, northeast side is where I do business. So I don't care if you've had one deal, five deals, 20 deals. Plot it on a map. See where your client niche lives. This is generally something that we can't control, but maybe we attract a certain type of buyer, military buyer, and they want to be near military bases. Uh, buyers who work in Austin, and now they're all up and down the 35 corridor. You just attract a bunch of farm and ranch folks, and they love the low home prices for the acreage down here. We just kind of attract a certain type, and then it just becomes cyclical. Certain price point, certain style of home, certain feature. Plot it on a map and see where your geographic neighborhoods are. Think of this as if you own a retail shop, where your little retail stores are, where your customer base is coming from. You can do this very easily in a tool from Google called My Maps, where you can upload everything as a spreadsheet. It'll plot it for you. It takes about five minutes, and I'll list that out in that resources on the tail end. So where you live, we all know where we live. We don't need to plot that on a map. But this will help you figure out where your geographic potential can be. <clears throat> the other thing that you can do if you're a relatively, who's had their license, let's say, for less than six months? Anybody or is still in school? OK, so we've got a bunch of newbies. Some of you all will be like, cool, I'll plot it on a map. Here's my one. That's OK. Take it and run with it. You don't have to have this thing that lights up like a Christmas tree in order to geofarm. So step number one, picking where do you want to farm. And we'll talk about turnover rate and how to figure out turnover rate and if it's a good opportunity or not. Cool, turnover rate, first thing I put there. You want to find a neighborhood that has at least a 5% turnover rate, and I'll show you how to calculate that. But basically, it's the number of homes sold in the last 12 months divided by the total number of homes in the area. Now, if you are like a few folks on my team and you are primarily new builds, your turnover rate is going to be jack because maybe that neighborhood didn't exist two and a half years ago. So nobody's lived there long enough to sell. Don't worry about it. If it's where you want to be, cool. I'm going to support you all day long. But if you're trying to figure out, you're trying to, uh, Sophie's Choice, which neighborhood to pick, look for those with at least a 5% turnover rate. If you can hit 7, 8, 9, 10%, primo. You want to find areas with enough homes with the right length of ownership. Some of that will come with turnover rate. But there are those neighborhoods here in town that are just full of lifers. Grandma bought that house in the 70s, raised the kids in it, kids moved off. Maybe they also raised some grandkids in that house. Those uh, children have since moved off somewhere else. And we have a bunch of folks that have lived in those houses for 20, 25 years. Not to say don't farm those neighborhoods, but generally there is a vibe within a neighborhood. Is it the neighborhood where people are coming in and going out? And we'll talk about the right length of time of ownership when we talk about narrowing down your list. And then number three, where is your budget going to go the furthest? When we talk budget, we talk two things. It could be sweat equity, which is you going out, pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, whatever that looks like to you, or check equity. I'd rather pay somebody to do some stuff for me because it frees up time. Remember, your time is money. If you came to my goal setting and time blocking class, you learned how to figure out what you're worth per hour. For me, I'm worth about $125 an hour. So if I can pay somebody less than $125 an hour to go out and source information and find deals for me, it's worth it. For you, if you're starting out new, trying to build that marketing budget, it might be sweat equity, maybe a combination of the two, both are completely valid. But think about what you're going to do with the data that I'm going to teach you how to source and figure out where your budget is going to go the furthest. If you were doing sweat equity and knocking on doors, maybe going out to the country where everything is three to four acres apart might not be the best option for door knocking. If you uh, are, again, doing sweat, sweat equity, find those neighborhoods where things are tightly packed. Maybe get a bunch of houses. Maybe there's a strong community organization where you can throw some sort of neighborhood event. We'll talk about some other ideas for sweat equity, as well as check equity. So 5% turnover, right length of ownership, and how to spend your budget. So now we get to the technical part, how to find homeowner data 
and to learn about that free tool that Sabor provides to each and every one of us. It's okay, it's me. <laughs> You're fine. Um, that er so the, the tool that Sable provides to each and every one of us, um, if you are watching from outside of the San Antonio area, I guarantee that your MLS has either the exact same tool or something very, very similar. Most uh, robust MLSs will have it. If you're a member of a small MLS like Four Rivers or Uvalde, you, you may not have it. Um, you can buy it on the open market, but I want to show you how to pull that data. So what we are going to talk about today is a tool called the Courthouse Retrieval System, or CRS. It's a tool that is included in your membership, at least for us here in Sabor, um, that allows you to pull home and homeowner data through the areas that our MLS serves. So if you've ever been in MLS, it's going to pull that data. If it's, uh, so it'll pull Bear County, Van Bear County, Wilson County, Norwood Bay, Comal, so on and so forth, Atascosa, all of that data is available to us. We can pull a lot of data, and y'all are going to be surprised at how many homes can fit into a neighborhood. Or maybe not so surprised when you look at those new builds with tiny little lots where you can literally reach out and hand each neighbor a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, but even in our older neighborhoods that tend to have larger lots, there are a lot of houses. Um, we're going to show you how to pull homeowner data, and then we're also going to show you how to narrow down your farm. We talked about your budget of your sweat equity or your check equity. I could pull up a 10 block radius and probably grab you 2,000 homes. Easy. Do I want to market to all 2,000? Probably not. We'll talk about how to pick who to market to and which ones to let lay by the wayside. So we can narrow down our farm by searching by subdivision. We can do a little geographic map search where you click and you draw kind of like when you're searching for homes for your clients and they want that I want to be here, but no further west than here, no further east than here, and I don't want to be any further south than that Valero, you've got to like, get real specific. We can do that in CRS as well. We can filter by owner-occupied homes or absentee owners, which would be things like rentals or maybe a house that was inherited and nobody's occupying it. We can narrow down by certain home sizes, square footage, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, lot size, all that sort of stuff. We can narrow down by length of occupancy, and I underline that because that is my biggest thing when I'm narrowing down my list, and then a whole lot more. CRS works a lot like an MLS search. You can search by a lot of those same details to be able to build a really good list. I talked about length of occupancy and that it's underlined, and here's why. So I love statistics. I talk about that every class. Um, I'm kind of a nerd that way. So I pulled a bunch of reports to see how long people live in their homes, at least for us here in the great state of Texas. I pulled the four big metro areas, pulled data for 2014, 2018, and 2020. So three data points over a 12-year period. Back in 2014 in Austin, 11.9 years, Dallas 14, Houston a little bit more than 14, and same here in San Antonio. Notice if we look at 2018, that number drops. So for the most part, we're looking at about a year and a half less over a four-year change. That means if that statistic continues, most folks for us here in San Antonio staying in their homes about 11 years on average. Now that's going to be, again, our military folks who come in, buy a house, stay here three years, and then get sent somewhere else. This is also going to factor that average Mima and people that have been living in their house for 55 years and you could pry it from their cold dead hands. But on average, we're looking at 11 years. If you're in Dallas, you're about the same, Houston a little bit less, and if you're in Austin, they are coming in, going out as quickly as they possibly can. I just had a question. Yes. I was wondering, is that also kind of correlating to like what the market is going to? Uh, does that have anything to do with how long people stay in their homes? Uh, like buying homes? Like, do you mean that like right now in this place and time that people are- How long the price? I don't like pulling data on a very short, little narrow window. Just like if I'm running comps, I'm not going to pull, hey, what sold last week? I'm going to take a look over a three to six month period. So for something like this, where we're looking for trends of thousands and thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of homeowners, I'd rather look at least two years to four years just to be able to spot that trend. Because if not, you're going to get either a false positive or a false negative because that, that flash in the pan is a little too short. 
So the reason why I pull up this data is if one of the things that I want to narrow down by is length of occupancy, I want to target those folks that are maybe pretty close to this and a little bit under. Find those five year, seven year, eight year folks, maybe nine, 10 year folks. So use this data depending on what market you're in or what market you serve. Again, everybody in the room, probably San Antonio, but those watching online, we may have some other uh, areas for you as well. Uh, but if you Google even something along the lines of how long do people live in their homes in whatever state you're in, you should be able to find some reports like this. If you can't, let me know because um, I have it for like 100 metro areas. So this is my data strategy. Everybody's strategy is going to be a little bit different depending on who your target is, who are you looking to farm. So for me, I love those owner-occupied folks, those folks that are looking to move up or move down. So I want to grab everybody who's lived in their home at least four years, maybe up to 11 years. The average is 11. I don't want to go too far over. I might go 12 if it gives me a few more houses to work with. I also like owner-occupied homes. Why? Because it means that they got to find some place to move to, and unless they're moving out of the city or moving out of the state, I get at least a second deal out of it. So I love owner-occupied. They tend to uh, be a little bit better maintained homes, and especially if you're dealing with historic homes, like what I do, you want folks that have taken care of this home versus I bought this, it's a rental, and it falls to shit, I don't really care. I want to target homes with an average or above average appraisal amount for an area. Again, I'm looking for owner-occupied, relatively move-in ready, folks who are ready to sell and move into that next chapter in their life. If you're targeting for investors, you're targeting distressed properties, we could do the strategy as well, and maybe you look for average and below assessed value. Homes that haven't been touched in a while, haven't been fixed up in a while. Maybe you don't pull owner-occupied, maybe you pull those absentee owners, those landlords who might be on the cusp of being tired of being landlords. So think about who you are trying to farm and I'll teach you a few different strategies on how to put your search together to make that farm work. For me, my goal is 400 to 600 homes for a mailer campaign. Ideal in check equity. So I want a laser focus list, but I also want enough to make it worth my while. So that is my data strategy. Mine and mine alone. You can steal it if you want, but it may not work for what your real estate goals are. I want to come to you just because you asked that question about turnover rate. Um, so it sounds like you've dipped your toes into geo farming at least a little bit. Talk to me about what your target looks like. What are you looking for? Well, I was trying to target my neighborhood okay. and the neighborhood next door. And uh, right now, uh, listed by EXP, there was only five houses. And the, both neighborhoods, there's uh, probably a good 20,000 homes. Okay. So. You, one thing that I picked up on is it listed by EXP. Yeah. Why Why that disclaimer? But that doesn't mean that those aren't homes being sold. No, I know. But but still, the, the, the homes listed is very low. I can look it up right now. Okay. Actually, we, we, we could use yours as an example. I would love to do that. So let's see court retrieval system in action. I'm going to pop out of my slide presentation for a moment. Again, this is something that's included in SABOR. So I'm going to walk you through it. Get to walk through mine here. The way that you get access to court retrieval system, up in this blue bar here in the top, and again, if you aren't a member of Sabor, yours may look a little different, but we have this option for tools, uh, resources, and links. It's this little square that looks like an arrow trying to escape in the upper right-hand corner. We're going to click on that. We have all this fun stuff that we are technically pay paying for with our membership to Sabor or NAR or a combination of the two, um, including our pay MLS fees. I love that they include that as if we're going to forget. So we're, right here, right above that is CRS, Courthouse Retrieval System. We're going to open this up. So we are here to prospect. Look, they make it very easy for us. I'm going to go to prospecting. It's like it was designed for it. Um, I'm going to go and start and do my neighborhood just because I ran this as a test and I know what the numbers look like. So first thing you're going to want to do is at least narrow down by a county or maybe two counties. Close to downtown, so I am Bear County through and through. 
Next thing we can do is narrow down by subdivision. If you have a specific subdivision, let's say um, you recently had a closing in um, East Terrell Hills, you can type in the subdivision name and pull up all those homes in that neighborhood and maybe do a farm of, hi, say hello to your new neighbor on West Covina, or you just had a listing, just sold, house on West Covina. Use your closings as your springboard to get more business. If people know that you're already doing business there, that means somebody in their neighborhood trusted you long enough to be able to help them either buy a house or sell a house or maybe both. So use that as your springboard if your specific neighborhood that you physically live in doesn't float your boat. So for me, um, I'm gonna go Monticello, I'm gonna go Monticello Park Historic, and I'm also gonna go Woodlawn Heights. So these are the two, Woodlawn, oops. These are the two neighborhoods, subdivision, oh, sorry, Woodlawn Terrace, I'll do both spellings. So these are the two neighborhoods, this little triangle right here, that technically makes up my neighborhood where I like to farm. So, yes, question? I, I just did the search uh, actually for both neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I would say there's probably a good 20 to 25,000 homes mm -hmm. and only four are for sale. We're looking for, remember that, uh, let me come back to my slides. Home sold in the last 12 months. So we wanna look historical data. We don't wanna go what's for sale right this second. Cause as great it would be to be like, I'm gonna grab, if five homes go up a month, I'm gonna grab all five. I wanna see what my year potential looks like. So let's go and continue on uh, in CRS. So there's uh, 1,904 total properties in this subdivision. Now I've emphasized total properties because it's also gonna include if there's any multifamily. So if I was to farm this neighborhood, this apartment complex would also show up as a property. It will also pull commercial. Commercials, real estate in this area, it's gonna pull that as well. I wanna compare apples to apples, so if I'm comparing residential single family home sales, I wanna make sure that this number has that as well. We can do that very easily by coming down to property type. And we see all the options there. So there's commercial, there's empty land. If you're in an area where it's just getting built up, maybe you wanna only, uh, only include the empty land because you wanna do that. So I'm gonna select residential here. And then the other place I'm gonna go is land use. So I'm not looking to sell to Spectrum, so I'm not gonna select cable television or gas distribution. Um, if you are looking to market to a bunch of mobile homeowners, maybe you select that. Again, this will help you narrow down your niche. For me, I wanna do single family residential as well as single structure property without agriculture. Depending on when the home was built and how it was registered in BCAD, single family will show up as both. If you're ever not sure, pull up a couple homes in that neighborhood in BCAD and see what that zoning is actually listed as because it can vary from neighborhood to neighborhood and length of uh, neighborhood development over time. So I have 1,762 properties that I could potentially farm to. I told you my target was 400 to 600. So the, the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna go, is this even a neighborhood that has that turnover potential? Again, we want ideally 5% and higher. We're gonna come back over to Sabor. So we all know how to search for properties when we're looking for something actively on the market or maybe something that was uh, recently on the market. But you can also search for the same sort of things that you can in CRS. So we know that I wanna deal in single family, I don't wanna deal in multifamily, I don't wanna deal in modular homes, so I'm gonna go single family detached. Uh, maybe if it's an area that has garden homes, I may select that as well. I know my neighborhood doesn't. Then we wanna see what has actually sold. So we're gonna come up here. Again, I don't care about what is expired, what is canceled, what is withdrawn. That just means a home that was either overpriced or somebody changed their mind. That's 
not what I'm looking for. I want to know how many closed contract opportunities pop up in this neighborhood in a 12 month period. So I'm going to go sold. I may also do pending because that means that we are pretty much at that finish line. Um, and right now with how quickly things are going, I might even choose to do active option. Couldn't hurt at least, at least right now. This may be a little uh, MLS 101 for some of y'all, but we can add in pretty much anything that you can see in those MLS sheets. We can add those as searchable fields in MLS. So I'm going to come to add remove fields and I want to filter by closing date. I want to see what happened in the last 12 months. So we're going to go, I don't know, uh, May 1st, 2020, let's say to today. So now I have an opportunity to pull up anything that is has a status currently of active option, sold or pending, that's a single family detached or a garden patio home that has a closing date if it's closed between May 2020 to May 2021. Make sense? Cool. Oops. Oh, why is that? Uh, that shouldn't be. Oh, I know why. Because I haven't narrowed down the location. So now we want to do subdivision. Again, we're going to compare apples to apples. So we had Monticello. Uh, Monticello Park is what we're doing. And we had Woodlawn Terrace. So here's our, oops, our total number of homes in those two neighborhoods. So in those two neighborhoods on a 12 month period, 90 sales. Boom. Boom. So now we do 11th grade math. And we're gonna take the number of sales. So we have had 90 divided by 1762. So that gives me 5.1%. Um, I would like for it to be a little higher, but this is my neighborhood. I've, I still feel good it is above that 5%. So questions on how to find the total number of homes or how to find the to total number of sales. So it's the number of sales in the last 12 months divided by total number of properties that match what I'm looking for. So total number of single family homes, because that's what I'm comparing it to. And then there's my number of sales. Does that make sense? So did you get a chance to run the numbers on uh, what you're like the last year over year? Well, actually I did the for five years and there's 1,737. Cool. Narrow it to 12 because it's going to throw that because we want 5% from that 12 months. So we've decided that, okay, cool, this neighborhood is a good one to farm. So now we're going to come back to CRS. This is how we're going to take this 1762 opportunities and narrow them down to the 400 to 600-ish that are going to net me the best possible chance of getting something good. So we talked about length of ownership. We have the option to filter by that as well. Ownership duration. So if the average person stays in San or lives in their house that they own for about 11 years, I want to maybe go, I don't know, five years to 12 years. It gives me 31. So maybe I want to expand it a little bit. Maybe one more on the on the top end and one more on the low end. You can play with these numbers to make sure that you're getting what your target looks like. Cool. One at 400 to 600. I'm at 492. I'm well within that range. I also mentioned that I want owner occupied properties. I don't want to deal with some landlord who thinks that his house is worth more. I like that warm, fuzzy homeowner feeling versus the how many pennies am I getting at the end of the day we have the ability to filter by that as well. We have owner type, owner occupied, update, 412, cool. So now I have 412 from that 1762 or whatever that number was. So now it's a laser focused with a high chance of 
an ROI, high chance of getting something from this list. If I hit everybody, I'll tell you right now, my neighborhood is one of those that's like we were talking about before that folks are coming in buying the houses of grandma and grandpa who died and kids don't want to deal with it. Come in, they fix it up, they, they flip it. So there's a lot of young families moving into that neighborhood. I guaranteed if I did anything um, under four years, I'd probably have another 500 in there. Easy. But I don't want to target to them. Why? They just bought their house. They don't have enough equity for it to be worth their while. Also, if they moved in after all the fix and flips started happening, who's going to have the most equity? The folks who were here before that. So I want to tap into, cool, maybe this house doesn't quite work for you anymore. Hey, maybe now you're looking to move on to that next thing. You're within that time frame that you are likely to move, and you have that opportunity for equity in that neighborhood. Again, my data strategy. If you're looking to deal with investors, maybe we don't care about ownership duration. And maybe we want absentee out of state and absentee in state. You want those folks who don't live there. It's just an asset for them. Maybe they want it, maybe they don't want it. You definitely want the ones who are likely to don't want it. Those absentee out of state, they can't even be there to manage it. They're probably paying a property management company or maybe it's a house that they inherited. There's only 18, but if you want to do something highly, highly, highly targeted, Cool, you have that option as well. So my point is, is that you can build your list to match what your goals are. Um, I'm gonna come to you just because we, we went through this exercise on a really pared down basis. Talk to me a little bit about what your target looks like. Who is your target homeowner? Um, I mean, so right now I just got my first listing mm -hmm. and it's investor. That a girl. Yeah. yeah, I know, I'm like, yay. Um, and he's an investor, and so he wants to use me as a footer, mm -hmm. you know, for all his transactions. So mm -hmm. something like that, doing an investing, and he's asking, like, hey, I can you find some homes off the mm -hmm. market? So I'm kind of tapping into that, and my best friend wants to kind of do that, so I'm like, maybe I can broaden that yeah. for investing. And for you, if, if you are specifically looking for properties that may have been there for a while, maybe you don't care about the subdivision. For me, I'm looking yeah. to build... I'm your girl in your neighborhood. I'm one of you. If you're like, I've got someone who's going to bring you cash for this house that you don't want, cast your geographic net wide, and now you focus on those out-of-state owners. And then you focus on maybe something like appraised value. And you look at some of those neighborhoods, figure out kind of maybe pick 10 target properties, see what they tax appraised for, do some basic math and look for anything, I don't know, under 100000 Maybe that's what that, that median is for that neighborhood. So you can really, really zero in and create something very targeted and very personal to the people that you're reaching out to. Questions on how to do some basic searching in CRS. I highly encourage you, and I'll come to your question, I highly encourage you to just come in and play. Don't worry about at least right now, the math of, oh, is that is that 5% or more? What if it's only 4.7%? What do I do? What is, come in and play around in your neighborhood. Play around where you just had somebody buy. Play around where you just had somebody uh, do a listing or you just sold a listing. Get used to using this system. Think of it like when you first started to learn MLS and you're like, how do I find a house? How do I make sure that it's got three bedrooms? You're kind of relearning it with a little bit of a learning curve. So I encourage you to come in and play and then really make some choices as to where you want to farm. Question. What's, what do you do, uh, like to get phone numbers? For so for phone numbers, it's a completely different ball of wax. There are some third-party tools that you can use. Um, for our team, we use Vulcan 7 because we have the ability to geo-search and pull phone numbers. The phone numbers tend to be pretty reliable. Um, Redx has a geo-farming phone number tool. Um, you can hire folks on Fiverr to do skip tracing for you. Uh, what, whatever you want to do, if you're looking to make phone calls, that would you're going to look for either some geo farming tool that has a phone number capability or hire somebody to do skip tracing for you, which can be a little bit pricey. But again, sweat equity, check equity, however you want to do it. Cool. Any other questions on using CRS and what's available to you? Cool. Y'all are clever. Um, one other thing that I am going to point out to you, you can take this list and make sure I want to target to somebody who's already got their house on the market. You can take out 
the ones that have sold, the ones that are sales pending, or not sold, the ones that are for sale, sale pending, just to make sure that you're not including in that list. Even though they've been there nine years, uh, they listed it 12 days ago, I caught them just a little too late. You can make sure that you're not tapping into some other realtor's client just to play nicey nicey. But yeah, come on in and play. Again, you can do your drawings, you can school zone. Again, you've got all of the opportunities here and all of the options for you, including um, acreage, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, year built, any tax exemptions. Um, if you're looking to target two folks, maybe looking to uh, retire out of their home, if you're over 65, you get a tax exemption. You can search by all the homes that have that exemption. And now you can target on feeling like you're in an empty nest. Let's talk about over 55 communities. Again, whatever your target looks like. So let's go ahead and continue on our slide presentation. So we've seen CRS in action. So cool. Now what do we do with this data? I have my list of 412 properties. Looks fun. I've got some names. I've got addresses. I know a little bit about their house. What do I do? Before we figure out what you are specifically going to do, I cannot stress this enough. If you are an agent who goes, cool, I'm going to pull 500 properties and I'm going to send 500 postcards and I'm just going to wait for my phone to ring and people to just come like slide briefcases of money onto my doorstep. That's not how this works. Just like anything else in sales, it's you got to follow up and you've got to be consistent. You can't build your name by just shouting your name once. I'm terrible with names. It takes four or five times of you coming and shaking my hand before I remember your name. And that's us with 10 people in a room. Can you imagine if they're getting your mailer and a Valpat coupon and someone wanting to sell them like solar panels for their home and people call and sell them a car warranty? You've got to stand out. You've got to be consistent. If you are looking to tap into your sweat equity, we may be talking Popeyes. Put together a little gift bag with something fun. Um, you think about these gift medals just for you? No, cool. These are great little Popeye things that I do. Um, and when I say pop by, like I said, you don't have to go out and buy something anything fancy, but just something like, hey, here's a little bag of candy, here's like a little seed packet, it's springtime, a little packet of wildflower seed, whatever you want to do. Some folks love doing pop buys. If I'm going to be out and doing sweat, sweat equity, I like giving stuff away. Uh, real estate Santa, I love it. So I'm going to do pop buys. Then there's door knocking. You cannot pay me to door knock. I don't want people knocking on my door. So I don't knock on anybody else's door, but there are people who love door knocking. And there's and there are some neighborhoods that are just like, hey, everyone just like, we all hang out. We're all like, hey, neighbor. And I'm like, that's why I live near downtown. We're not like that. Um, <laughs> but maybe door knocking is the best opportunity for you or what you enjoy doing. And that's the big thing is what fits your budget and what you enjoy doing. I'm never going to tell somebody, go knock doors. And they're like, no, thank you, ma'am. Nor am I going to go, do not ever knock a door. And you're like, but I love it. I get my steps in. It's super fun. I love the sunshine. Can't relate. But if that's what you are, great. Go for it. Door knock your heart out. Uh, door hangers, kind of that middle ground between a pop by and a door knock. You don't actually have to knock on their door, but you're not really leaving them a gift. Maybe you're leaving them a little bit of information or a little flyer in the door. Something like that that, again, introduces yourself. The pro especially if you are door knocking or leaving a little something beyond just here's real estate information, it's definitely more personal. If I were to knock on your door and you were the one person in my neighborhood who would answer it, um, get to know my name, my face, hey, I'm your neighbor over on Waverly, I just wanted to come by, I'm a real estate agent, wanted to see if there's any questions I could answer, bring in my neighbors about their real estate goals. Definitely more personal. The con, it's time consuming. Again, time is money. Your time costs money. You are worth money. Your time is worth money. So think about that when you're thinking about your time factor. Um, cost will still be a factor, unless you're purely door knocking with just your business cards, paying for door hangers, paying for Popeyes, definitely a little bit less of a cost, but it is still going to be a factor. So keep that in mind when you're getting realistic about okay, what can I do in a day, how many days do I want to dedicate to this, and what tools do I need to have on me as I'm wandering through my neighborhood. Um, some of the things that you can do down the road as you start to build your name if you're not wanting to do more of that check equity stuff is um, sponsoring any sort of like neighborhood things. If there's like a neighborhood newsletter, 
anything like that. That alone won't get you enough, but it's great to pair in conjunction with these one-to-one, one-person-to-one household sort of interactions. Check equity. Community newsletters. And not, I'm going to put an ad in the newsletter that our HOA does. No, this is my newsletter that I have complete control over what goes in it. So I can put, here are the homes that have sold in our neighborhood in the last 30 days. Here's a community event that I heard about. Here's a little uh, bit of history for our historic neighborhoods. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, top 10 tips for getting your backyard summertime ready. Whatever I want to include. I have complete control. Postcards. These are great for just sold, just bought. Again, somebody moves into the neighborhood and you were their buyer's agent. Say hello to your new neighbor on Blank Street. You just sold a property in that neighborhood, just sold, big bold letters in contract in 17 hours or whatever it is. Highlight the best part of that house. Sold for over asking, whatever that looks like, you can use that to your advantage. Again, if you're doing something like a just sold or just bought postcard, make sure this is yours. Don't grab, don't try to farm Alamo Heights and grab one of Phyllis Browning's 1.2 million. Go like, say hello to your new neighbor on Agarita. Um, you, in your newsletters and things like that, you can do a general, here are the homes that have sold. But if you're doing a single property, it makes it sound a little bit too much like you were the procuring cause and you don't want to get into that sort of argument, especially when it comes to track. And then letters, flyers, market updates, uh, any sort of direct ask. Hey, we, if I've got a buyer looking in my neighborhood, then I'm going to send letters out to those homeowners. Hey, I've got a buyer. Don't ever lie to homeowners, by the way. Don't go, we've got so many buyers, we don't know what to do with them. They all want to buy on your street. How weird. Uh, make sure that you're being honest. So if you have that opportunity to do some sort of direct ask, I've got an investor looking for homes in this neighborhood. This is what he or she is looking for. Boom, 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 boom. We can have an opportunity to look at your house. That would be great. Saying I have a buyer whatever the case may be, market update. Hey, uh, 90 days ago, the average home price in our neighborhood was 274000 Since the last 90 days, it's gone up to three hundred one. I would love to get you some information on what your home is worth. Get creative. Have fun with it. So the pro for this is that it's a larger reach. I can easily send 400 to 600 mailers. So I buckle down for a good full day, put mailing labels, put stamps on it. The con? It does require consistent financial investment. I will tell you, you own a business. I drove by like four Raising Cane's billboards driving up I-10. They advertise. Probably don't even need to. We all know what Raising Cane's is. We just yell, where's the nearest one? We go get our chicken tenders. McDonald's advertises. The nail salon that you go to advertises. You didn't just randomly find a business. The mortgage company that you use, that you send your buyers to, advertises. You're a business owner. Have a marketing budget. Consistently take part of your profits, put it back into your business. That's what a successful business model will do. So if you want to start small, that's cool. You start with your door knocking, you get one closing, cool. Maybe you take 200 bucks of that, and now you do a really good newsletter. 55 cents a piece, put a stamp on something, easy peasy, and now you're just rolling and making that snowball bigger and bigger. Cool, so how much do we need to do this? I mentioned a cons that consistency is key. I mentioned if you're tapping into check equity, you do want a consistent financial investment into your marketing budget. So if you really want to hit the ground running, if you're a brand new agent, you've never marketed to a, whatever specific neighborhood with whatever specific target before, for your first 90 days, you want three touches a month. So over 90 days, that's nine reach outs. So that could be, maybe you want to do a little sweat equity, you go around and you knock some doors, maybe you send out a postcard, and maybe you send out a little front back newsletter. That's month one. Maybe month two, you do another round of door knocking, because hey, we've got two pieces of mail from you, and maybe you do two postcards. Mix and match, have fun with it. But the consistency is the number. How many times do they see your name and your face? How many times are you actively in their mailbox or on their front door. Um, if you are looking to maybe do phone calls and invest in like a skip tracing, I would bump this up. Because you're going to make phone calls and they don't want to answer. So unless you're actually talking to them three times, make sure that you're really kicking in all those phone calls. And then every 90 days, so on day 90, 
180, 270, and 360. I'm doing a multi-page newsletter. So really nice print, front page, inside front, page three, back page, newsletter. Honestly, it doesn't cost all that much. I can generally get newsletters printed. I can get 500 for maybe 110 bucks, and then it's 65 cents a stamp. And then the time to just print out Avery labels on a printer at home and sit and watch 90 Day Fiance and put labels on stuff. Um, it's a great way to multicast and watch trash TV. Time. Um, so every every 90 days, every three months, you're sending something that's a little bit higher value. Again, get creative with your newsletter. Newsletters may not be the best option if you're casting a wide net for like investors, but if you are truly farming a neighborhood, you're looking to build a brand in that neighborhood. Newsletters are great. I love also including like a little trivia effect. Um, here's a little trivia question. Email your answer to my email. I'll draw one render, uh, one winner at random to get a fifteen dollar gift card to go have breakfast at Pancake Joe's. It's a little cafe in my neighborhood. Tie it back into your neighborhood. Get your local businesses to maybe co-brand with you. Advertise in it. Offset your cost. Couldn't hurt, right? If you're building to, to be that go-to in the neighborhood, to be a pillar of your community, involve your business owners as well. A lot of lenders also will that. Right? Yeah, lenders will do it. Um, home warranty will do it. Um, yeah, reach out to your vendors as well. Um, I love bouncing like month by month. Hey, so and so air conditioning company. Hey, it's getting ready to be summer. What if I gave everybody like a ten percent coupon for your AC company for an AC service? Would you mind paying for a quarter of my stamps? Cool, no problem. Awesome. Hey, so and so, can I put a coupon for your business in? Will you pay for a quarter of my stamps? And I just need to find four to plug in there. That's how newspapers exist. Newspapers don't make money off printing the news, they make money off of selling advertisement. So you become like a little mini newspaper. So that's every, so 90, 180, uh, 270, and day 360, so once every three months. And then once you've gone for, through that first 90 days, just two a month. You've done, oops, you've done that heavy lifting to build some momentum. Now you can just kind of go on cruise control. Good thing is those newsletters count for one of the required reach outs. So if I'm on month six, I do my newsletter, that's required every three months, and then, I don't know, another little market update or another little something just sold in the neighborhood, here's a list of home, whatever I want to do for that second one. Everything that you do should push back to some sort of, sort of lead converting website or CRM. That should be all over your mailer, whatever that looks like. If you're doing a postcard, maybe on the back you have a little side that goes, um, visit whatever your website is to find out what your home is worth. <coughs> visit blank to search for homes in San Antonio. Visit blank to get your free list of uh, recently rehabbed homes in the neighborhood. Whatever you want to do, but it's all about pushing it back to some sort of lead converting website. Um, for us here at EXP, we have KV Core, which has that built in. Cool, another free resource, something else you don't have to pay for. Awesome. Your goal, again, is to become the trusted brand in the area. Just like your neighborhood has, this is the dry cleaner, this is the bodega, this is, you are now the real estate agent. Make sense? Again. <clears throat> I should have put it again, but consistency is key. Don't do it. Cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy into this like three every every month or the first three months. Then you send one, and then you're like, Damn, it's been seven weeks. I guess I should do another one. People will pick up on your consistency, both as a good trait and as a bad trait. If you are consistent about your marketing, subconsciously they're gonna go. They're gonna be consistent if I'm their client. If you're inconsistent about your marketing. Eh, they don't seem really into it. So why would I be really into that? So let's finish up with available resources. I love cheap and free stuff. So of course we know Court Retrieval System and the cheap and free resource. We talked about My Maps. If you pull up Google and you type in My Maps, this is where you can go in to build your map to upload all of your deals and see where your work farm is, where you're doing the most business. Again, use your past business 
as clout for your future business if your neighborhood, the neighborhood that you live in, isn't a good option. Again, you just moved into a new built community. Cool. You and everybody else has lived there for 13 months. You're a couple years away from it being a really good option. But use my maps to build any sort of maps that you need to build. Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, a um, bunch of freelancers out there ready, willing, and able to do whatever you need help with. So if you're like, I don't know how to design a postcard, um, newsletter, that seems intimidating. How do I do it? All your graphic design work can be done really cheap by hiring somebody on Fiverr. Helps out a freelancer who's looking to pick up some extra work, and now you don't have to stress about it. I can generally, if, if I want to hire somebody to build, like when we did, um, we did some marketing campaigns for social media for like a giveaway that we're doing, and I got someone to like create like a really cool background and edit some photos for like ten bucks. Like it, it's it's worth it. Canva, Canva is they have a free version. You also can pay for a premium version, which is like ten bucks a month. And if you are like, I want to kind of control my own graphic design and create my flyers, my newsletters, my postcards, greeting cards, whatever that looks like. Canva has every template in the world for you. So from digital, so your social media stuff, your Instagram, Instagram stories, Facebook, all that sort of stuff, down to every sort of print thing that you would want to do, up to and including 20 page booklets. You can find a template for it in Canva, as well as all of the fun little like clip art stuff and royalty free images that you can upload. So if you were digging into doing any sort of top buy type stuff where you want to hand them something or like a, a door hanger, you can do that on Canva. Um, if you're in EXP, we also have our marketing center that has a lot of door hanger templates and uh, postcard templates as well. But I like Canva because I like it to be my personality. I like it to have my team's logo on it so that way I can make sure I brand it the way that I want to brand it. Pinterest. If I ever go, I don't even know what to do this month. Pinterest, again, it's free. You can Google real estate postcards, real estate newsletter, real estate pop buys, real estate door hangers, whatever you want to do, and you will find 8,000 people who have better ideas than you have. Cool. Take inspiration from everybody who's knocking it out of the park and make it your own. If you're looking to get stuff printed, um, I do not work for them. I'm not getting a kickback. I don't have an affiliate code. This is not like my YouTube channel. Um, Nextdayflyers.com. I have, again, no connection to them, but I've been using them for a while, and they consistently have some of the best print rates that I've found for postcards, and uh, they can do postcards in multiple sizes, so everything from a four to six up to like the big like six by nine ones if you want to do that. Um, they're also great for uh, business cards, that sort of stuff. Uh, if you're going to do a multi-page newsletter, there are some better rates out there. But the thing I like about Next Day Flyers is they get me stuff pretty quickly, and if you ever Google Next Day Flyer coupon code in Google, you will always find. 10%, 15% off, so again, I like I like this count. The last thing that I want to point out is we didn't really talk about including for sale by owners as a target, but if you are farming a neighborhood, check Zillow for FISBOs. Maybe you want to split those out from your you know, 412 list and send something a little bit different to those for sale by owners, or maybe if you're looking to combine your check equity and your sweat equity, send the mailer to everybody, Pull up those FISBOs and those are the ones who get the door knock. Hey, I just noticed you probably got my mailer last week, right? Awesome, cool. Hey, I just saw your for sale by owner sign. I just wanted to pop by, see how things were going. What, no contract yet? How can that be? Um, and then you can become that resource for them as well. So these are all, with the exception of next day flyers being, you know, just paying for your printing costs, these are all things that you can use for free or less than 10 bucks to be able to free up a little bit of your headaches, free up a lot of your time, and make, you, make sure that you come out looking professional each and every time. So um, who wants to share? Uh, I will call on somebody. Kind of like, Kirsty, want to share kind of what you want to target now that you have this information. Neighborhood, type of homeowner. Who wants to share? Thought I will call on somebody. I will. Yes, Mel, thank you. Uh, no, we just moved in December. Uh, so as I was telling the other day, uh, out to our area, and there's we're like two groups, so there's like four gated communities right in that pocket. And um, anyways, we go, you know, we walk every every morning and evening, and you know, Veronica thinks we're walking, but I'm really like stalking all the neighborhoods. Um, so this is this is huge because um, you know that's that one piece I've never tapped into. Yeah, the, the neighborhood stuff. And um, 
So I'll, I'll sign this time. I, have a, I do have a quick question. Though. Yes. When you did, um, when you went back to the CRS mm -hmm. and it pulled all the addresses, yes. what's the best way to grab all those addresses from there? Great question. And the, yeah. It's almost like I primed you for that. Uh, so the best way to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and take out these extra little things that I put in. Uh, where are we? Homeowner. Owner type. Okay, I'm going to come back to my list for my neighborhood with my owner-occupied stuff in Monticello and Woodlawn Terrace. Let's take out this appraisal amount. So I want to hit everything. Oops, there we go. Okay, um, I obviously have some other filter in there. Okay, here we go. Let's go back to my four, two, what do they have, 12? Let's go with that. Cool, close enough. So over here on the right-hand side, we have two options. You can export it, which will export into a CSV or something that you can open in Excel. So there's like that download CSV and it'll pull up all of these fields. So you'll have the owner's name, the owner address. Now, if I'm pulling up owner occupied, the owner address and the property address are gonna be exactly the same. It'll pull up that length of occupancy, any details um, on, I'll pull up this one so you can see what shows up in that spreadsheet. Details on the home itself, uh, tax value, last day or last time that it was sold, all that sales history, so you'll have all of this in that spreadsheet in case there's other ways that you want to filter it. So very easy, export. You can also come in and click create labels. So you can buy address labels from like Amazon, the Avery address labels, ones that are three across by 10 down to so 30 per sheet. And directly from here, have it print. We've got all the templates down here. Right, so the Avery 5160 are the three by, uh, three by 10, the, the 30 per page. You can go, okay, which label do you want to start on? I want to start, oh, I want to skip that first one. I don't know why, but let's start there. And then go down, create labels, and then you just send it to the printer at home or FedEx office or whatever. There, there's the PDF. There you go. Ready to go. Print them out. Throw whatever TV you're embarrassed to watch and stick labels on postcard letters, whatever you want to do. Question? All right, so I don't want to do all this already, but as far as... Uh Mm -hmm. What's the most cost effective way other than just buying? Um, you could, cost effective way honestly is going to be, hey, Mr. Postman, give me a roll of 100 stamps. Because there's no like discount for like, can I yeah. buy 1,000 stamps and now they're cheaper? Right. Um, there is like stamps.com where you can print out postage, but it does it like one at a time. And I don't have time for that. It would take me like 10 times as long just to get stamps. Right. So it's worth it to not save two cents a stamp to save me four hours of time. Yeah. Um, postcards. If your postcards are the regular, like four by six, like when you go to the airport buy a postcard, just regular postcard size, those are 35 cents per stamp. Anything bigger than that is gonna be the same as a letter, which is 55 cents per stamp. So if you wanna mix and match and maybe save yourself a little bit on postage one month, do a four by six postcard. Those are great for the um, say hello to your neighbor or just sold postcards because you're just you're just featuring one card. You don't have to put a bunch of text on it. Right. Let that image really shine. Pop your 35 cent stamp and then make your other marketing something a little bit grander, either a six by nine postcard or a letter or something like that. So the post office you just ask for postcard postage. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you get those? So those obviously go like on an envelope or something. Mm -hmm. How do you get addresses to a postcard? You know how we get them in the mail? It's got like Oh, like the current resident or, yeah, so you, I wouldn't recommend, because that's basically as if I didn't do any sort of filtering. So the person who moved in seven days ago is going to get it the same way that someone who lived there nine years ago, the same person that a renter or an empty house. So that's through something known as every door direct mail, where basically you are paying a, the post office to go to everywhere that that letter carrier in that segment goes to. So we're talking probably 10,000 houses. It's a little bit too wide of a net. You're not going to save that much money to get that kind of percentage return on investment. Oh, I'm sorry. So mm -hmm. I'm not like Mr. Daniel, right? Yeah. So can you, is there a way, or do you know a way to get like that exact name, mm -hmm. address, everything on like the postcard? All I do is I print out labels and I put the labels on the postcard. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so 
just one other note, if you're like, I don't want to deal with labels or stamps and I just want to offload it because you have a marketing budget that will support that. And I do this from time to time when it's really busy for me. Next uh, next day flyers, and there's a couple other ones, will actually handle your mailing for you. You just upload your list and go, cool, here you go. I can mail out about 500 postcards printed, mailed, someone else's problem, and I just trust that they're going to get there for about 450 bucks. So it works out to just under a dollar a postcard. But I basically just go, here's my image, here's my list, have at it. And I don't have to think about it. So you just download like that list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just download it as a as a as, a, as a, or the CSV spreadsheet version and go, here you go, send postcards to each and every address and they'll do that. So you have a, again a bunch of options based on your time and your financial reach and what you want to do. But again, if you keep your list laser focused, you're gonna have a better chance of getting something back on your return. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Other questions for me? Dude, that was awesome. It's, I, I love it. I, I, I will be the first one to admit that I've been, I had been consistent-ish, which means not consistent at all, um, until about the first of the year. And I'm now starting to see those, that return come back to me. So don't get frustrated if you're like, well, I did, three a month for 90 days and I didn't get diddly. Cool, come come back to me at month nine and let's talk. Again, it is a, a long game. As far as your neighbors go, this is your grand opening of your business. There isn't enough buzz yet. They have to, if you open to Russia, they'd have to drive by, oh, let's check that place out 10, 11 times. We do it ourselves. Be that postcard like, oh, we need to check them out 10, 11 times. If you took any of my lead generation classes, we saw that most leads convert after touch nine to 12. So you're 90 days in, nine mailers in before they're even going to consider thinking about you for anything real estate. So just keep at it, it will pay off. Again, assuming that your list is laser focused for the highest converted folks. And now you know how to do it. Um, any other questions online or in person before I make someone take home 15 bagels? Mm -hmm. The hard to get yeah. I'm living through. <laughs> cool. Well, I want to thank everyone for showing up today. Um, come grab your Fiesta medal before you go. Um, for those of you who are watching online, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the stone team. Same for y'all in here. Basically, every training that I've done in here has been recorded and uploaded. So if you missed any of the previous trainings, you can watch them archived there. Uh, two weeks, no, not two weeks. End of next month, because we're changing up our training schedule. But the next training that I'll be doing is about running comps and using Realtor Property Resource. So if you're running comps on MLS or you're like, I comps intimidate me, this will blow your mind. Uh, yeah, the 18th. June 18th. So yeah, we'll have that up on event Friday. Everyone will get an email reminder. Um, call me, text me, email me if you've got questions on anything real estate related. Um, if you're looking to join a badass team, give me a call. I would love to talk. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for watching online. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. My mom, Stephanie, drink some bagels. No, you're welcome. Did you love it? No, yeah. So I'm going to make the take like all of the bagels. For real. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. 